Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you. I understand it was pretty cold this morning. Is that true? I mean, I, it was cold when I got up, but one of, the, one of the children came up to me and they said, Pastor Ron, it was 22 degrees at our house. And I went, how, how cold was it at your house? And I said, well, it was probably pretty similar to your house. And then they said, 22 degrees at our house. How cold was it at your house? I said, I don't know. I said, I don't think it was that cold. And I'm thinking... You know what what's going on here and then somebody said yeah it was 24 at our house so i, I guess it was cold this morning I, I guess the frost on the trees probably should have been the first indication that it was uh, pretty cold i must not have been paying a lot of attention but what a beautiful day and we're looking forward so looking forward to tonight and the evening of thanksgiving it's going to be a great great time uh, i hope uh, that you're able to make it it's really a sweet sweet time of of ministry and just giving of thanks uh, to the Lord. And I want to announce this morning, I want to announce uh, a special meeting. I want you to write on somewhere on your calendar or put it in your iPhone or whatever. Oh, no, you turn your iPhone off. No, don't put it in your iPhone or record. <clears throat> but just write this meeting down. We're having a special church meeting on Sunday night, December the 4th, here at the church uh, in the sanctuary from 6 to 8 p.m. So there's not going to be any home fellowships that evening <clears throat> in light of this meeting. There's no home fellowships tonight uh, because of the uh, uh, evening of Thanksgiving. There's no home fellowships next week because it's the last Sunday of the month. There won't be a home fellowship on, on December 4th because we're having our, our special uh, church meeting. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what that church meeting is, all, uh, is about. And I'm really excited about it. And if you'll notice from your sermon notes that the title of this message is just a little announcement. And the reason that's the case is because as I was jotting a few notes about this little announcement, before I knew it, I had 10 pages and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to try to, nor should I, uh, cram in the rest of Acts chapter 8. So I want to share some things that the Lord has put on my heart regarding where we are as a church and what we have to look forward to on December the 4th. <clears throat> and we actually had a slide to remind you of the date, but it said all church meeting. And it isn't an all church meeting. It's a, it's a church meeting if you want to come. You don't have to come. You may listen to the announcement and say, oh, sounds all right to me. I don't think I need to go. Not, not a big deal. But if this sparks your interest, the things that I'm going to share with you and you feel like, Boy, I really want to be there. We'd love to have you here. I think it would be a good thing for you to be here. If you, if you want to get a sense of the things that, are, that the Lord is doing in the church, then I think it would be a good thing for you to be here. <clears throat> but I want to share just a couple of things with you. Uh, but first, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you do speak to your people. And I thank you, Lord God, for the things that you're showing me I thank you, Lord, for the things that you're speaking to my heart. I thank you for the things you're speaking to the leadership's heart. I thank you for the moving of the Spirit in our midst. And I ask right now, Lord, that you would just cover our time together. Give us attentive ears, attentive hearts, attentive minds to what the Spirit has for us, Lord. We know that every time we draw closer to you, the enemy tries to figure out a way to get things stirred up. Oh, he loves to get things stirred up. He loves to be the author of confusion. He loves to just uh, draw uh, disparaging things uh, towards you because he hates you. And we're here to declare before him and all of his minions that we love you and we're committed to you. And we want to do your bidding. We want to do your will. And so, Lord, just be in this service. <clears throat> we look forward to what you have for us. We look forward for a time of worship at the end of our, our uh, looking at some things from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, just about, uh, uh, just a year ago, as many of you know, um, there are a lot of new people who have, <coughs> have, have started to come to our church since uh, just in the last year. In fact, how many of you, just raise your hand, if you start coming to church in the last year, that you're fairly new to the church in the last year. Okay, so several people have come. 
So I want to just remind you that uh, a year ago, we were finishing our ninth year, and the Word of God was speaking to my heart louder than it had ever spoken. In my own personal devotion time, as I was reading the Word, my heart was just being quickened in such a profound way. And yet there was this uneasiness in my soul, this restlessness as to where the Lord was taking us as a church. I had just finished teaching through the New Testament. It had taken me nine years. And I had just finished teaching through the New Testament. And there was this restlessness that was going on and I couldn't figure it out. And I talked to my wife about it and I said, I just can't figure out what is going on and why that is. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and it was right at our ninth anniversary, and I was going to be faced <coughs> with, uh, okay, now I need to figure out what the next book we're going to teach on Sunday, because it's the, it's the uh, I've taught through the whole New Testament, Lord, so now where do you want us to go from here? And the Lord spoke to my heart, and he gave me a caution. And here's what he said. He said, Ron, you know how to do church. You know how to do Bible studies and have retreats. You know how to do church potlucks and have church picnics. You know how to do all of those things. But he said, don't get comfortable in those things. And I pondered that for a while, and again, I wasn't quite sure everything that he meant by that. But in essence, as time went on, he was saying to me, Ron, I don't want you to get complacent in doing church, I want you to be my church. And so I began to pray, and I ended up, as many of you know, shortly thereafter at the very same leadership or the pastor's conference that all of our pastors went to <clears throat> last week in Brooklyn, New York, at the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church under the leadership of Pastor Jim Simbola. How many of you have heard of Pastor Jim Simbola or read? Or, okay, a lot of you have heard of him. And so we went. I thank you so much for your prayers. Um, the Lord spoke profoundly to each of us individually and then corporately. He's authored the many books, one of them being Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, which is a new book or which is a book which we've been looking at for the past year in our Discipleship 401 group on our Saturday mornings. And I have to confess that when I first got that book, I put it on my bookshelf. I didn't look at it for 10 years. And the reason I did is because I thought, you know what, here's a guy, fresh wind, fresh fire, fresh power, fresh this, fresh eggs. I mean, what's going to be next? Because, <clears throat> because the bottom line is we all know that there's, it's like the prayer of Jabez that swept through the church. Next thing you know, there was a children's prayer of Jabez, and there was a teen prayer of Jabez, and there was this, and there was that. And it seems like in Christianity, there's these waves of things. And I confess that <clears throat> I put it on the shelf, and I said, well, you know, whatever. But then the Lord brought me to, uh, to Washington, D.C. at a conference, and who was one of the speakers? Jim Cimbala. I said, okay, this should be cool. We'll hear what he has to say. And the Lord just convicted my heart with some things. I thought, wow. What just so happened since we were in Washington, D.C. at this conference, and my wife, Jenny, was with us, that we went to um, New York to just spend a few days. I'd never been to New York. She had been, and we were just going to have a little vacation there. And I thought, well, let's visit, let's visit Brooklyn Tabernacle while we're there. And it was just an unbelievable experience. And the Lord continued um, just through that conference that we attended a year ago. He continued to give me a, great, a greater burden than ever for the lost and really had been giving me that burden that the Lord would bring us people who desperately needed Jesus. You remember we began to pray for that. Lord, bring us people. Bring people to our church who desperately need Jesus, who have problems that are bigger than them but not bigger than Jesus. As well as increase our understanding of how desperately we need Him as well. And so I began after that conference to, to make some changes with these things in mind. And some of you remember, or you may not because it may not have, I mean, you may be oblivious to this, but I certainly am aware of it, that it ruffled more than a few feathers. And people started to worry. 
And unfortunately, I heard more about it through the grapevine rather than from the people themselves. And the waves of concern, they would come <clears throat> and they would go, and we pressed on in seeking to be the Lord's bride, right? Because we're the Lord's bride. We're the bride of Christ. And new people would come, and a few would leave, and some of the regulars would leave, and there would be more discussion about it, again, through the grapevine, and there would be a little bit of, you know, misunderstanding, uh, as I would hear of, you know, I wonder why they left, and, and there was concern. And all the meanwhile, <clears throat> the Lord is showing me and the rest of the leadership of the church how desperately people need Jesus and how He is the only answer. Amen? Do you believe that? That he is the only answer? And the Lord continued to confront me with the seriousness of what I do as a shepherd and a pastor of his flock. And that brings you right up to about the last few months. <clears throat> You've heard me share on a number of occasions when Paul was saying uh, goodbye to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20:28. 20, and he said to them, he said, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now that's a serious thing, isn't it? To leadership. It's a serious thing to understand that we are to take care in how we shepherd, how we oversee you all because you've been purchased by the blood of God. <laughs> no small deal. Pretty significant. <clears throat> and then as I shared on Wednesday, I read recently Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you, that would be us, and be submissive. But that's not the part that, uh, because you guys are awesome. But this was the part that shook me. For they watch out for your souls. Now, I don't mind watching your dog or your kitten or, well, actually, we'd have trouble doing that because Jed wouldn't like that, but our, other, our dog. But to watch over your souls, to watch out for your souls. And then it says, as those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And I was suddenly struck, really in a way that I, that I had not been before, I was struck with the immensity of this responsibility as a shepherd of this flock, right here, as a shepherd of you, that at the end of my life, I will stand before Almighty God and give an account for how well I watched out for your souls, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. And I'm not sure what happened, but I started loving you like I have never loved you before. Some of you may be saying, well, I didn't feel it. <laughs> hey, let me tell you, I'm trying to figure out. I haven't had to love this many people. And I loved you a lot before that start happened. And it is a love that flows directly from the heart of God. A love that flows from the heart of Jesus. And I am asking Him, I'm asking Him to intensify that love like never before. So you better get ready. I might just grab you and give you a big fat kiss when you walk in one of these days. Just, hey! Because I just, I love you. I just love you. And the Lord showed me years ago that, that, that when we, when Jesus, who is infinite, who is, who is the epitome of love, enters into our hearts, do you know he gives us the capacity to love infinitely? You realize we'll never run out of enough love? That in Jesus, I have enough love to give you, and it'll never run out. And as I look out among you, this morning, as I think about the hundred women who were called, uh, who were in this sanctuary yesterday, seeking to understand our call to holiness, 
As I consider those saints that the Lord has brought to Veritas Christian Fellowship in Tacoma, I realize that God has brought, listen, God has brought you. And that he has brought this most amazing group of people that I have ever been around. Each one of you, there is not one of you that would not fit into that category that God has shown me he has brought this amazing group of people that I have ever been around. And I believe with all my heart that he has done it for such a time as this. And I am in awe of what God has done. And I'm humbled by the responsibility before God to shepherd you and to watch out for your souls. And words cannot even begin to express what runs through my heart when I say that. I trust the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. And so I thank you so much for those of you who prayed for your pastors this past week as we again attended the, the pastors' conference at Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. <clears throat> the Lord again confirmed some things that he had been putting on my heart, some of which I shared on Wednesday. If you haven't had a chance to listen to Wednesday's message, I'd encourage you to do that. And one of the things that I love so much, I love so much, I love so much that, that he doesn't let me pick up a book and then go, oh, thanks for showing me all this stuff through this author. Or I love that he doesn't ever let me go to a conference and I come back and go, oh man, now I'm ready to. I love that he begins to show me those things before I ever open the book. I love that he has me in my, in my, um, I don't even know what to call it, arrogance in my foolishness or whatever. I love that he has me put a book like Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire on the bookshelf for 10 years before I even open it up. Because he wants to show me something by his spirit in my heart before I ever attend a conference or before I ever read a book. More of this I'll share <clears throat> at this meeting on the 4th. And so my desire at this meeting on the 4th is to share more of my heart for what I believe the Lord has for his church in general. But more specifically to share what I believe the Lord has for his church here at South Hill Calvary Chapel at Veritas Christian Fellowship. And the only way that I can think of to do that effectively is to take some time to share with you the journey the Lord has graciously allowed me to take over the last 34 years. Now, that might just, oh my word, how's he going to do that? I mean, he goes long as it is. How's he going to cover it? I promise you that we'll do it reasonably succinctly. <clears throat> Fourteen of which those years were not necessarily in his will. I was a Christian. I love the Lord with all my heart. But I was tossed to and fro by various winds of doctrine that were not solid, that were not sure, that were not certain, that were not biblical. And God in his mercy, he, he drew me out of those. And it was a 14-year wandering uh, through the desert. It was a 14-year wandering of people telling me, pastors, you'll, you'll never learn to hear from God until you hear from a pastor from your leader, from your spiritual uh, shepherd. You'll, uh, you know, you're heading to the dead. If you leave this fellowship, you're heading to Egypt. And I remember to a spiritual death. And I remember just, uh, he said, I remember he said, you're heading to a spiritual uh, uh, a death. You're heading to the desert. You're heading to Egypt. And I remember the Holy Spirit prompted me to say, you know what, God lives in Egypt too. I believe that this evening will be a tremendous encouragement to you from the new believers who are just trying to figure out what this Jesus thing is all about to the person who had never attended a Calvary Chapel or heard that much about Calvary Chapel until they stepped through our doors and the person who, like myself, Calvary Chapel represents a safe and a sane place in the sea of of craziness, which we call Christianity and churchdom today, to the person who was born and bred 
in Calvary chapels and has determined they'll never go anywhere else until their last dying breath. Because we have all of those types of people here at South Hill Calvary Chapel and, and at Veritas Christian Fellowship. <coughs> and I believe that this night will settle once and for all for each of us what God intends His church to be. And we'll find that it will tie in perfectly with those things that we've been learning in our study through the book of Acts. It's going to perfectly set the stage for us getting into just the regular life and the establishment of churches. And with all of my heart, as a Christian, with all of my heart, I believe that God is calling His church, His bride, to rally like never before to accomplish His will and His purpose to fulfill the Great Commission. Amen? Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. To preach the gospel, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching these new believers how to observe the things that Jesus taught. And I believe that the Lord is calling the leadership of this church to rally like never before to properly equip the saints for the work of the ministry and the building up of the body of Christ until we come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of Jesus, the Son of God, to become mature Christians in the fullness of Christ. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4. I believe that God is calling the servants of the church to rally like never before, to make sure that the saints are being cared for in the daily distribution of things, that hospital visits are being made, that people are being prayed for, that food is being delivered to people, no longer delegated to a few so that everyone else can just come to church and get fed and go home and call it good. But the whole body, as it says in Ephesians 4, that we would be joined and knit together, effectively working together, everyone doing his part, his share, causing healthy growth of the body and the building of itself in love. You know, every time I read Jesus' words in Matthew 9.36, where Matthew says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, <coughs> he was moved with compassion for them. Because they were weary. They were scattered. Like sheep having no shepherd. And then Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to stand, send out laborers into his harvest. And I believe with all my heart that we must pray the Lord of the harvest like never before. Amen? Like never before. You've heard me say it. If we could come up, you know, we've got some smart people in this room. We've got some creative people in this room. And if we could come up with a way to reap the harvest some other way, don't you think we would do it? I think we would do it. Don't you think that Charles, who heads up a team, and, and Pastor Allen to go to the mall, don't you think they would have said, you know what, the gospel thing's not working. People aren't connecting with it. So we need to re-strategize our thinking. And isn't that what ha what's happening in churches today? People are re-strategizing. Why? Because it's not happening the way they think it should be happening. And one of the reasons why it isn't happening is because they put the word, they put the spirit off to the side, and they've turned to the ideas in the mind of man rather than to the heart of God. And what he says to do. I believe we're to pray like never before. To send us out. To get us out of our comfort zones. Including me. And to be willing to go wherever he tells us to go. To do whatever he tells us to do. To say whatever he tells us to say. Because do you remember he's our Lord? Is that right? Amen? He's our Lord. And as I look out upon the multitudes, you want to see the multitudes? Go to New York. You'll see multitudes. Fly into New York. You'll see multitudes. And as I look out among the multitudes, 
I see that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people and they're perishing. They're perishing. Just like many of you in this room once were. Do you remember when you were perishing? I do. As recently as this past month, looking at the people, weary, scattered, sheep with no shepherd, and they need Jesus. They need the one and only shepherd who can rescue their souls. Amen? It's okay to say amen. I have, to, I have to say amen once in a while just because maybe you're not. Don't say amen unless you mean amen, okay? You see, there are a lot of bad churches out there. Now, don't get me wrong, because there are a lot of good churches as well. But I am beginning to believe that there are more bad churches than there are good. Now, I wish that that were not so. I wish it were not so, but I fear that it is. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, look, hold, keep your hands up. Put your hands up. And I want you to look around. I want you to look around how many people have their hands up. We know that that's the case. We don't want it to be so. I don't want it to be so. And people are being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, every wind of teaching that comes their way by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. If you think that some of these churches aren't doing some deceitful plotting, they may not call it that, but do you think that they're not doing that? If you think they're not doing that, you're wrong. Because they're giving in to satisfying man than satisfying God. I experienced the sad reality of this. Uh, I experienced the sad reality of this in my first 14 years of my Christian life, trying to figure out what Christianity was. And since then, in the last 20 years, I've heard the multitude of stories increasingly from those whom the Lord brings into our church or across my path. I was just hearing stories yesterday of such things. Listen carefully to what the church, what the Lord Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, let me remind you, Jesus is talking to the church. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the church. He's talking to his bride. And he says, because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, we use that in evangelism. That the Lord is standing at the door of people's souls and knocking. And there's a part of that that's, that's true. But listen, Jesus said this to the church. <laughs> to the church. He says, church, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and opens the door, I'll come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And I believe that this is a graphic picture of what is happening in Christendom today. Amen? In the church today. Because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Jesus is outside of the church at large, knocking at the door, asking if anyone hears his voice, praying, hoping that the church will open the door. And if you think that that can't happen, if you're a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, don't kid yourself. Because I believe it can happen any time you decide to quit doing the things that Jesus says 
and think you'll be fine just teaching the things that Jesus says. Jesus said, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Now, brothers and sisters, I'll tell you that I know of good Bible teaching churches where people aren't doing the things that the, the very teachings say. We don't ever want to go there as a church, amen? amen? Nor will we ever go there as a church under my leadership. Because I've been called by God to shepherd this flock which God has purchased with me, his blood. And because I'll give an account as to how well I watched out for your souls. And I've heard on more than one occasion that as a church, we aren't really growing. And I beg to differ. You see, because growth isn't always measured by the number of people filling the seats, but it is more often measured by the things that are happening in people's hearts. And let me assure you that we are beginning to grow like a wildfire. I'm certain of it. And when the flame is fully fanned, we're going to see a depth of growth that will impact everyone around us. I know for a fact, I hear the people, I pray with the people. You do as well. That there are things that are going on in people's hearts like I have never seen and heard before. In my 34 years as a Christian, and 30 years in Christian ministry, people are praying, people are crying out to God, people are seeking to understand and know God's word like never before. Not so that they can have some sort of intellectual discussion about Jesus, but because they're coming to a place where they have nothing else. They're up against a wall. They're backed into a corner. And they need God to come through for them or they're just not going to make it. And these are people who have been sitting under Bible teaching for years. Because I believe sometimes Bible studies aren't enough in and of themselves. They need a work of God in their lives. They need to know that He is real. They need to know that all of the things He says in His Word are true. That everything is true. And some of you may know that, and I may know that, but for some reason, there are so many people, they just have a tough time believing it. And there are so many of you sitting here this morning that this applies to, and you know who I'm talking about. You're up against the wall. And we're praying for you. I just talked to one of our elders this morning. I just talked to uh, Ed and said, I'm searching God's Word to understand why are there so many people in our church today with cancer. His wife of, of many years died of cancer. Seeking to understand from God's Word. And I'm here to tell you it's true what God's Word says. And God is going to come through. Amen? Amen? He's going to come through. Now, I don't know how. See, that's where it gets goofy. I don't know how. I just know that it's true. I don't know what it'll look like. But He'll come through because He's God and there's nothing too hard for God. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Do you really believe it? Are you ready to start acting on it? And you could say, well, pastor, just tell us how. I don't know how. I just said that earlier. But God's word knows how. And the Holy Spirit is there to, to direct us and to teach us and to instruct us how. And the Lord spoke to my heart this morning, Hebrews eleven six, But without faith, it is impossible to please God for he who comes to him must believe first that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
And he spoke to my heart this morning and, and, and he just said and he reminded me sometimes we can get so caught up in getting through our study, getting through the chapter, getting through the book that somehow we forget to diligently seek him. We forget that part. I've been guilty of that. Can I be real honest with you right now? The Bible study, the delivery part of church is easy for me. It's easy for me. The standing up and communicating you and taking you through the word, it's easy for me. It's the seeking diligently that I find to be hard. It's the getting on my knees and crying out to God, God, speak to us. God, heal people that are hurting. That's the part that is hard. It's easy to teach a Bible study after 10 years of teaching a Bible study. Let's open our Bibles. I can do that. And we'll continue to do that. But there's some answers that you're looking for. I know God has them. And I know he'll, he'll give them to us. We must come to him. Pray that I'll come to him more. That I'll believe that he is who he says he is. And that he's a rewarder. That he'll do what he says he'll do. For those who diligently seek him. This has been a great week. <laughs> you're probably saying, it doesn't seem like you're having a great week. No, this has been a great week. A great week of ministry. Monday and Tuesday at the conference in Brooklyn, hanging out with just three of the greatest guys on this planet, one of which happens to be my son. Receiving word, receiving word, praying, seeking the Lord. Wednesday on the plane, and God is so good. Oh, I tried working on my messages because it's a long flight, four or five hours on the way there. You know, with the seat. I mean, I don't know what United's deal is, but and I'm trying to get, you know. But God is so good that when we got on the plane going back, somebody just randomly said, and actually it wasn't necessarily a good situation, but anyway, it ended up being a blessing to Pastor Jason and I. And they came up to us and they said, you know, you two guys, would you mind, uh, we've got a couple of seats in the bulkhead and one in the exit row, would you mind... Uh, so that we could, I could sit together with my coworker, and we said, no, that'd be fine. And I mean, I had all kinds of leg room, and I was able to just really work a lot on the, on the message and, and, and get it ready. And then Wednesday evening of sharing with you, then Thursday night, MIT2 class, and, and the 10 people who are eager to learn how to teach the Word and being able to share them. Then Friday night, uh, two hours here, uh, beginning with our women's ministry um, retreat with the Pursue Holiness, and then all day Saturday teaching on Pursue Holiness, and then Saturday night uh, going to Veritas Christian Fellowship and finishing up the John chapter 1. It was a great night, a great week of ministry. And I got up at 2 this morning because <clears throat> I wasn't quite ready for this morning. And... Uh, and to prepare for this morning, by all rights, I should be exhausted, but are you kidding me? I'm fired up. I'm ready to, I might have a coronary before we're done, but I'm fired up. And this has been a great morning for me, and let me tell you why. A highlight in all of my years as a pastor, a memorial stone for me. Some of you know uh, who, who attended the Pastors of the Leaders Conference, the Northwest Leaders Conference earlier uh, this fall in September. And remember Ben Corson, the son of John Corson, he gets up and he gives a teaching. And I've heard this happen a number of times. And, and he said, um, he said, he's a young guy, I think he's 20, 21, something like that, 22 maybe. And he said, um, I, I, I've never said this, and I've always wondered that, that the guys that do say this, but seriously, I had a message all prepared. And last night, about midnight, the Lord told me that I wasn't to give that message. And, I, and then he gives this most profound message, that, and it's like, God, how does that even happen? I mean, I would throw up if I thought 
I had from midnight to uh, 9 o'clock in the morning to teach a Bible study. Certainly, yeah, a Bible study. I mean, I just, I said, how does that happen? Well, it just happened this morning. It just happened. I thought I was going to make a little announcement about a special meeting. But Pastor Ron, we didn't get to finish Acts chapter 8. You didn't tell us to turn in our Bibles. Do you trust me? Do you trust Jesus in me? Do you trust the Jesus that you've seen in me over these past 10 years? Do you really think, if you've sat under my teaching for any length of time, do you really think that somehow I'll wake up some morning and somehow begin to teach you anything contrary to the Word of God? Or to quit teaching the Word which He has magnified above His own name? After all you've heard me teach, after all you've seen me do, this will never, ever happen. I cherish the value of his word more than I ever have in all of my life. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But we must never be so content that we take the word in, that we don't apply it, and we don't diligently seek him in the process. The Lord really put it on my heart to have this meeting on the 4th. He did that on, on Friday, I think, Thursday or Friday. I can't remember which one. As well as, as a couple of other special meetings along with the home fellowship leaders and elders of the church. And this morning as I was getting ready, I began to think about this announcement. And I started getting worried. And I said, oh, I think maybe, maybe I shouldn't have had that meeting. I started second-guessing myself. And as I was getting ready to pray in the office, my guitar was there, and I just wanted to worship the Lord. I just wanted to be with Him, that's all. And I got out my guitar and I began to praise Him. Began to sing these songs. Tell him how much I loved him. How much he meant to me. And I began to meditate on when he saved me. And what he saved me from. And I began to cry. And he began to speak to my heart. Much of what I shared with you this morning. And as I stand here before you, I breathe a sigh of relief. And I say, Lord, I told your people what you wanted me to tell them this morning. I've been a good shepherd today. I watched out for their souls. And it all came about because I believe you who you are, who you say you are. And you do reward those who diligently seek you. The Bible says we're to study to show ourselves a proof of God. Men who rightly divide the word of truth. I'll never stop doing that. I'm praying to search the scriptures like I've never searched the scriptures before. But I am not content to just stand up here week after week after week after week to get through the scriptures, and I tell you, I feel that pressure at times. I feel that pressure. And today was such a blessing to have had the number of pages ready to go in Acts. Praise the Lord, I'm ahead of the game for two weeks from now. And to just know that, that the Lord telling me it's okay. It's okay. And so if there's anything you can pray for me for, just pray. I know you pray for me. I feel your prayers. But there's anything you can pray for me for, pray, Lord, will you help our pastor hear your voice and give him the courage to do what you tell him to do. That would mean more to me than anything else you could ever pray for me for. Father, we come before you this morning. 
and we're comforted by the fact that we have nothing to worry about. When we look to you, when we trust you, when we cling to you. And Lord, I confess, I don't like to get choked up. And, but God, we need you. We need you to move in our church. We need you to move in our hearts. We need you to tell us what it means to be your church. I need that, Lord. I need that, Lord. Lord, I've been a part 12, 12 to 14 years of seeking the, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit with no knowledge of your word and it leads to foolishness. It leads to a gross misrepresentation of you. Lord, I want nothing to do with that. But Lord, I confess to you on behalf of our church that there are times we read the scriptures and we see what it says. We don't see it happen. And we don't know why that is. But we're comforted because it's not by might nor by power, but by spirit, says the Lord. We're comforted that your word equips us, and it completes us, and it gets us ready for every good work. We want to do right by you, Lord. That's all. We just want to do right by you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would protect these precious souls. And that we would bravely just, just come to you. Not with a bunch of head knowledge but with transformed heart knowledge that says we need you in our lives. Lord, there are youth that are dying all around us. They're just dying. There's neighbors that we haven't talked to because we don't know how to talk to them. So we're just asking you to, to do what you promise you'll do for us, to show yourself strong in our lives as we express loyalty to you, and that's what we're doing. We're just saying, we love you, we need you. And so will you receive our praise? Will you receive our worship as an offering? of our love for you and our devotion to you. Will you pour out your spirit upon us anew? Will you help us to not be afraid? Will you inspire us to not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word? Lord, we have people that are facing death we have people that are Peter said who you, you, Peter said you said to Peter do you want to leave as well and Peter said who would we turn to Lord you're the one who has the word of life We've come to believe and know that you're the Holy One. 
of God. And the reason we knew that, know that, Lord, is because you, you've transformed our lives. Now we're just asking that you'll show us how to, how to live that out. Praise your name, Lord. Church, let's just give our hearts a fresh and a new to the Lord. Let's let the Spirit seal those things that are racing through our hearts and our minds. Right now, let's sing together. Lord, you have my Pray. 
We're going to close with one more song, and let me just exhort you. One of the things that the Lord spoke to Pastor Jim, I don't know how long ago, but was the importance of prayer. And he started what has become really world-renowned as their Tuesday night prayer meeting, where 3,000 people start lining up two hours before the meeting starts to pray. And one of the things that struck me this last time we were there, I've only seen, been to that prayer meeting twice, was that about an hour and a half, once they open the doors at five, about an hour and a half, as people start uh, coming in, the elders line up at the front of the platform and people line up to pray. And the line is about a hundred people strong. And as I was looking at the people, and, I, and there was this one particular man, and he came over and he, and he said, he, he, he gave these people that were already sitting, gave them his coat, and he said, I'm going go to go get in line to be prayed for. And it dawned on me that these people come early because they believe God answers prayer. And I heard that there are some who view and have called, so I've heard, the walk to the front for prayer, the walk of shame. Now, I, I totally understand what that individual was saying, uh, what, what they were thinking and meaning by that. I, I totally understand that. But I don't want us to ever think that is a walk of shame. That is a walk to God's mercy and His grace and His love. And week after week, I say, I'll be down in front to pray. We'll have leaders on each side to pray. And week after week, very few people come. And I know that it isn't because there isn't need here. I know it's because we're embarrassed or what will people think. Church, can we grow up as a church and knock that off? We want to pray for you. We want to believe with you. For whatever you bring in this church, whatever heaviness of heart, if you don't know the Lord, we want to pray with you to receive the Lord. If you're worried about the smallest thing, we want to pray with you. If you're overwhelmed by the biggest thing, we want to pray with you because we believe that the prayer of fervent men and women accomplishes much. Amen? Amen. So at the close of every service and sometimes before the service ends, we step down. And can we be mature enough, can we be humble enough to come for prayer? How many of you need prayer in your life? <laughs> we need prayer. You know, Francis Chan did the thing. I've never seen this done before. He gets up and he said, you know, before I pray, can I ask you to pray for me? Can I ask you to pray for me? And we all put on our hands and we prayed. He said, I need a word from God for you. I'm humbled by the responsibility of what I'm about to do. And you know, initially we go, I'm thinking, even I'm thinking, well, that's a little unorthodox. That's not the way we do it. And are you reminded of how many times we do church that way? Well, that's not the way we do it. And yet, I thought we're supposed to do what the Lord tells us to do. And so the Lord tells us that we're to pray for you. So from this point forward, as we have every week and every Sunday, every Wednesday, we're going to be down here to pray. And may I be so bold to say,
shame on you if you leave this place without coming up for prayer or turning to somebody. I mean, it's not just limited here. You can pray for one another. That's okay. Did you know that? I give you complete permission to do that. It was so cool yesterday. We had these women and the Lord put it on my heart. There were women that were weeping before communion. And it was, and I said, I want you women, if there's something, if you're up against the wall and you know, I want you to stand up right now. And there was probably 20, 30 women. I don't know how many women stood up. And then I really stepped out of the box a little and I said, now I want those women, I want you to look and, and I want you to go to those women and I want you to lay hands on them and I want you to just pray whatever God puts on your heart to prayer. How many of you, wasn't that a sweet time of just ministry of God's love to the church? See, that's what the church does. Sure, we teach through the word and we're going to always teach the word because that's what the church is about. But not exclusive of being the church, praying for one another. Amen? Can we settle that today, once and for all? If we can, can we just, can I hear just a hearty amen? Amen. amen. Okay. Let's sing of that glorious name that is above every name. At your name, the mountain shake and crumb. That's right, Lord, at your name. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will pass. We believe the earth rejoice. Your people cry out. skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord, 
we thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you've met us here in this place. We look forward, Lord, to the coming weeks as we continue to learn about your church. We look forward to Chris Rep coming and hearing of how the spirit moved in and through her this past year. We look forward, Lord, to not just doing church, not, not, not doing church anymore, but just being the church in ways that we never have before. We love you, Lord. We look forward to what you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen.